Hello, friends. Welcome to the ATC Double Cut. I have a special guest today. It is Dr. John Rowland, who is an agronomist with the USGA Green Section for the Florida region. Hello, John. Welcome to the ATC Double Cut. Hey, Micah. How's it going? It is going it, it is going good. And uh, man, I, I sure have enjoyed following some of your research and having uh, some nice. interesting conversations with you about yeah. <laughs> turf grass management and warm season turf. And right. so, uh, you know, you did all the stuff on uh, nitrogen rates versus, you know, nitrogen to potassium ratio and drought yeah. stress and stuff. It's a big, big topic. That's yep. a big topic. And you did stuff on uh, <laughs> growing rates, right? Like, Absolutely, like nit yep. not how much nitrogen is required for the optimum growing rate for not only Absolutely. for Bermuda grass, but I think you also looked at, at a zoysia variety and you also looked yes. maybe at paspalum and, on that. Yeah. Yep. A seashore paspalum variety as well. Awesome. Well, in the, uh, in the show notes, I can put a link maybe to the uh, Turfgrass information file uh, link for, for your name and people can pull up some of that uh, interesting research because it's you're one of those unique people who have had a PhD degree and have also at the same time been a golf course superintendent. Right. It, it is fairly rare. Yes, it, it's fairly rare. rare. So we've Jordan got Booth is another one. With the with the USGA, he's he's one of maybe a handful that I know. And yeah, there's uh, Doctor Brett Morris in Australia got a PhD, okay. and then he's with uh, Syngenta now. But he he uh, was a golf course superintendent for a while with a PhD, and then uh, Doctor John Dempsey in Ireland. Uh, we can kind of name <laughs> name them on on a few fingers. Um, right. There, there's there's a few PhDs like like myself. I was never a golf course superintendent after I got my PhD. I was a golf course oh, superintendent okay. before I went to grad school. But the people that I was both. Yeah. The, so so the people that do both, I just I think uh, there's something very uh, unique about that, and it, it's really good to be able to provide that or to bring that scientific training and and all that extra book learning and and laboratory and and uh research farm learning to bring it to golf course maintenance that's true i agree 100 percent. so i've you know i i and then when i read your research papers i know that you also have that practical background of of knowing that you have to produce conditions day after day after day so your your that's research true. really resonates with me so um, I, I, I just wanted to say good job and, and, uh, I, <laughs> I enjoy reading your stuff. Now you sent me an email a couple, uh, oh, a couple months ago, I guess we've been trying to get this scheduled for a while. Yep. <laughs> um, and, and so we'll give the ADC double cut treatment to a particular post that, uh, I wrote in September. Um, okay. and I'm bringing that up on the screen now, John, I, I don't think you can see it with our setup, but it's, uh, oh, okay. it's the blog post seasonal change in soil pH in a tropical monsoon climate. And sure. I, I was responding there to a question or, or a comment that you'd asked. Uh, I, I had written, I I'd shared a blog post that I'd written. Uh, and I was saying, I recommend annual soil testing at least. And the reason why I was recommending annual soil testing for one reason was to prevent rapid changes in soil pH, which I think can happen, especially when you have a year round growing season and you're growing turf in a sand root zone. And, and you replied, and I quote now what you wrote, you said, would this site have increased pH during dry periods? If so, there's no need to apply lime and play ping pong with pH, meaning the, the pH would be bouncing up and down. And you put a couple laughing emojis and a ping pong emoji. <laughs> good, good work. And uh, there must be something to those uh, emojis. Yes. Because when I ask, well, yeah. when I ask, I, now I don't do this regularly, but when I ask chat and GPT to suggest a, AI generated tweet the yeah. they it it invariably returns a text that contains emojis 
So, <laughs> so that must be the, the, the good way to do it these days. So well done. So you're saying I may be AI. Is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, may, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I had a, a conversation, I think, uh, James Hempfling, uh, mm-hmm. from Enview, uh, he, yep. he, uh, he'd found a very interesting analysis tool last year, I believe, prior to the, a lot of the API uh, disabling that's happened at X, formerly Twitter, uh, where, where one could access the API and check tweets. And so right. he, he shared a tool where uh, this particular service was checking any accounts tweets and then it would return comments on like this person is is writing tweets in this way and they're they're you know they tend to correspond with with people or they tag people in tweets or whatever and it one thing that it said was whether you use a lot of emojis or not which just Uh, kind of struck me i'd never even thought of it (laughs) and then anyway i i tend to notice that now so anyway i I use a lot Good, good. So that makes it fun to read. And after yeah. that, it said, especially, so you're asking if we should play ping pong with pH, if the pH would naturally be changing during dry periods. And then you said, so, especially if turf quality is high, this may be another area where habitual reactions may not be the best, as I have seen very high quality turf with a pH less than five. And yes, so that is... uh a very nice comment. And so I replied, I said, I've also seen high quality turf with soil pH less than five. Although in a sand root zone, I'm quoting myself now, although in a sand root zone in a tropical monsoon climate, there's not much buffering of the soil pH against the acidifying effects of nitrogen fertilizer and precipitation. So I generally prefer to manage turf in such a root zone, keeping the soil pH above 5.5. And what I then did uh, is I, I showed some charts where I didn't have a long-term data series for that particular site, but if you- But it was re- pretty good. It was pretty good. If you recall, I went yeah. uh, to a nearby site where I had yep. 10 plus years of dry season versus rainy season. And I showed that at that particular location, the- soil pH was relatively constant, uh, and it didn't really matter whether it was dry season or wet season, there wasn't a consistent change. After a few years, right? Mm -hmm. Was that, were those first data points taken when the green or the grass was new or just planted initially? Yeah, Uh, but it it was a different site than what my original post was about. Right, Um, Right. But it was within uh, 30, 30 miles or something like that in the same country, in the same climate um and and so yeah i i find that uh of course if you have bad irrigation water quality then you could have quite a difference but if you have um and that's what sort of brought me to make the point or make the comment because you know i always like to be involved in some way in your conversations if possible especially if i have anything to add usually um, so down here in South Florida, we're not far from that tropical monsoon uh, type of environment. We have you know upwards of 70 inches of rain a year and uh, pHs. We have a lot of almost all sands, very little clay, and the pH just sort of bounces around. I, I'll see pHs in the high to mid sevens and I'll see them in the low to mid fours. Um, and I've, again, you know, I've, uh, I've seen really, really good turf and I have a picture if I can figure out how to show it to you Mm -hmm. of turf at pH 4.7, where, uh, when compared to, uh, soil or when, uh, turf, sorry, uh, in the mid to, in the mid sevens is dramatically different. So that's just one point. But the point I was getting at was the water quality down here in Florida is very high in bicarbonates and calcium. So just by irrigating, you're essentially liming. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of trying to ask you if you had a similar situation there and how you treated it. Because here in Florida, again, after a few irrigations, we've essentially limed Mm -hmm. the, the grass. So I don't usually get too carried away when I see a low pH reading, especially because 
it could just be the the reading or the uh, sample was taken shortly after a fertilization or a heavy rain mm -hmm. or maybe in rainy season or maybe in dry season. So I don't put a whole lot of weight on one test. And I, I would rather see multiple tests here actually versus even just one because in conditions like these, we, we the more we use our, our high, excuse me, our high pH irrigation water, obviously the higher pH the soil is gonna get, it may be short lived uh, depending on how much you're fertilizing and how much is raining, but we're sort of bouncing around from anywhere in the mid fours to the mid sevens. And it, I'm not, I don't know that uh, it's necessary down here because we have very little aluminum, if any. And I know that under 5.5, you know, you're you're dealing with a couple of issues there potentially. But I always thought that the pH would bounce around and get back up over six and I shouldn't be too concerned about it. And that is a wonderful explanation. Thank you. And I I think that you're exactly right. Don't overreact to one single test. And I guess the re the reason why I was saying this this particular decline worried me uh, because that was an 18 month or more interval between tests. Right. That's and right. and it had gone from something like 6.2 to 4.7 or 6.4 yeah. to 4.7. This is actually in the Philippines in a sand-based root zone. And I've seen from experience in the Philippines at other places, the pH does not tend to go back up because uh -huh. the, the water quality, the generally the water that's being irrigated with is not having the liming effect like what you're having mm. in Florida. Right. So because of that, I was like, whoa. So I, I, I know if you're at 4.7 and you continue to fertilize with nitrogen, which is tends to be acidifying, if right. yep. and grass growth and clipping harvest tends to be acidifying and precipitation tends to be acidifying. And I just didn't yep. see where the pH is ever going to bounce back up. So then right. even if there's, of course, there's a risk of aluminum toxicity, although if there's no aluminum in the soil, we, it wouldn't yeah. happen. But it, I'd also be concerned about just a lack of vigor and I'd be concerned that was actually on a T. So I'd be concerned about a lack of vigor and I would be concerned about adding nitrogen to try to increase uh, divot recovery, but then not right. having as much microbial activity to break down the organic material in the soil. So, right. but you know, I mean, the, the real recommendation should be test at least once a year, yeah. maybe twice a year. The only time I would go more than twice a year is if you really have some salinity issues where something's happening where you could kill the grass or, the, you know, the grass right. can die from salinity. So if, if you have some issues where that could happen, then sure, do it more than twice a year. But um, I, I think, you know, sometimes we also have some random changes. Uh, yeah. And and you have variability in, in soil sampling that, that can be, uh, it's about 10 to 15 percent of just 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 because we're taking really small sample sizes. So um, the, there, if we test too often and the numbers bounce around, then we also run the risk of overreacting. Right. And you never know when the superintendent took the sample, he may have just fertilized a week or two ago and he could have a tremendous amount of acidity in the soil from the breakdown of ammonium or ammonium in the soil, or it could have just rained an inch or two with a pH of, four to five. So, you know, that's why I, I look at the sample. I'll be, I'll express some concern about it typically, and I'll try to get another sample or certainly scrutinize the next sample that I look at, um, to determine what steps should be taken. I'm going to bring up the, the blog post again. I'm going to show a couple of charts that I made to that are from the nearby golf course. And then, uh, we're going to change topics to talk about something that also came up at the same time as I was responding to that. Um, so, uh, let's have a look at this blog post again, but uh, I will look at it and the people okay. watching I'm the video and, and you can follow along. So 
the first thing I did is I looked at this site where I had uh, soil tests all the way back to 2010. So it's like a 13, yep. 13 year time series. And pretty much every year there was a sample taken dry season and wet season um, in this tropical monsoon climate. Um, in, in this part of the Philippines, it is, um, yeah, there's basically a six month rainy season, six month dry season, and the temperature doesn't change much, but the precipitation does. And the first thing that I did was not look at pH. I wanted to check that my samples were relatively correct, uh, in, in that I identified when the dry season won and, and when the, when the dry season sample was and when the the wet season sample was collected. So I check that and I use sodium soil test. Sodium is an indicator of that because although the, uh, the pH doesn't change much at this site, there's, there's just a little bit less leaching happening in the dry season and a little bit of sodium that comes with the irrigation water. So it just tends to accumulate, but not very high. The it only, the sodium was only over a hundred parts per million on a Malik three extractant, which is not very high. Uh, certainly not a worry for, uh, Bermuda grass or other warm season grasses. It was only over a hundred parts per million twice in the dry season, but in every single one of the samples, uh, since 2010, the dry season sample had higher sodium than the wet season right. sample. So it I, was very clear. Yes, that was very clear. So I was like, okay, it looks like, um, the, the wet season sodium is always about 25 parts per million. The dry season sodium is always about 40 up to 150 parts per million. So I've correctly identified the samples. And, and if you want to try to uh, check for uh, wet and dry season samples at your side or check for sodium accumulation uh, or salinity accumulation, I think this is a good way to do it because in the wet season, because of leaching, the sodium just goes away. Um, you don't even really need so much gypsum for that. Uh, in, certainly in a sand root zone, you can just add extra Done. irrigation water, <laughs> leach it, and the sodium goes down. So yep. once I'd identified that, then I looked at the pH and this chart was a little bit more complicated, John, but it, at, at the start, you're right. Um, it was, it, there was quite a difference for the first few years, 2010, 11, 12, 13, where the dry season pH was about almost at one unit higher. So the, the wet season pH was just under 5.5. The dry season pH was from six up to almost seven. And that happened for the first three years. And then for the past decade from 2013 up to the present, uh, sometimes the wet season pH has been higher. Sometimes the dry season pH has been higher and, and they've been in the range from about six up to seven. And so it, it hasn't, has not plummeted during the dry season and it has not spike. Sorry. It has not, has not plummeted during the wet season has not right. spiked up during the dry season. And I think that shows a couple of things, which is one, when the greens are young and have less organic matter, there is less buffering. And so it can change a bit more. And then uh, as greens mature and get a little, little bit more organic matter and have sensible management. And I kn knowing uh, the golf course superintendent at the course where this data is being shown from, knowing about how that turf is managed, then I can say it is sensible management. And, and so then in that part of the world with that type of irrigation water, we do tend to see pretty consistent, uh, pHs. Yeah. So, yeah. And then you also showed another chart a little further in that blog, if I'm not mistaken about the aluminum, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the aluminum in the soils. And it was very clear that above 5.5, the aluminum was just not in soil solution. <clears throat> that's that's and I want to ask you I want to ask you a question about that. So those samples below 5.5, I know a bunch of them, the aluminum seemed to be a little bit low in soil solution. I don't know what percentage or parts per million it was in, but of those samples that were on the higher end in solution, how many would you have or would you say if if you if you know um were um, were showing any type of damage? 
if I, you had to guess. Oh, I I can't answer that specifically because for those samples, I, I now collect the data uh, that puts a rating to each sample. And back, That's a great idea. Okay. And then back <laughs> then when those data are being shown, so the, in the related posts, um, it's it's not in the exact same post, but it's down below that in the related post section. If you click on oh, okay. on some of those, it will lead sure. to the aluminum type of posts. And yeah, above five point five, you just don't. There's no aluminum in the soil. It's not an issue. Yeah. And the solubility spikes uh, below five point five, and that sure. can be toxic to roots. And uh, I. I'm just going to guess 25% of the samples are, are problematic. Um, Sounds but, like a good guess. But I don't would have you, data you, on it right now. Yeah, sure. Would you say zoysia is a little more tolerant to, to aluminum than Bermuda grass, or uh, are you not familiar with that? I, I think it or is. I, I, yeah. I think it is. I think there's research that documents that, and I don't know if it's for every single species and variety, because there are varietal right, right. differences, but I think in sure. general, one could say that that zoysia could be more tolerant. But uh, you know, with zoysia, I don't want really low pH because uh, one of the features of zoysia is it tends to produce a lot of organic material near the surface, right. and yep. you might, uh, if you have a sporting surface that's uh, fine bladed zoysia it can get soft if there's too much organic material. So you mm -hmm. want that to break down as much as possible. So if the, if I'm managing zoysia, the zoysia itself may be okay at 4.5, but I'd be concerned right. that I'm not getting as much microbial breakdown of organic material as I, as I otherwise could be. Yeah, that's a good point. So that is a wonderful way for us to transition into the organic <laughs> matter slash organic material topic, because at about yeah. the same time as you were um, prodding me to uh, perhaps give a more, uh, right. uh, you know, just, just broaden my perspective on the pH issue a little bit and, and just bringing, you know, and it's a wonderful reminder that the, pH uh, is going to change with the weather, change with the irrigation water, and just be mindful of that. Be mindful of your site. Don't overreact to any single test and just think about what's really happening. Uh, so at the same time as you were providing that very sensible and reasonable feedback to me, Chris Tritabaugh made a blog post about what he's been doing for the past couple of years at Hazeltine National Golf Club. Uh, on Which is bent, great. on bent grass, and he's he's doing something that that now it's it's obviously possible for at least a few years because he's been doing it and getting the results, documenting the results. But it's something I never thought was possible. He didn't think was possible, and that is to basically eliminate in season top dressing and just have really nice greens day after day without this light and frequent top dressing that has now become an industry standard and so he made that post and just kind of explaining again because it takes a while for people to to really wrap their heads around what 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 maybe what works with that or what's risky about it or what's not risky and whether it might work at their site somebody sent him a question and said well that's very interesting i wonder if this would work on bermuda grass so chris responded saying he's never managed bermuda grass and he can't be certain but from what he knows about professional turf grass management in general he has some expectation that it could work on on bermuda grass and and he hopes that some people will try it and, and whatever and so I was reading that post and I, and I thought, whoa, there's there's a comment. And I'm always interested to see what the comments are. So I checked the comment. There's John Rowland. It's like, whoa, OK. So this guy, this guy has some experience with with uh, Bermuda grass. And and you wrote that, yeah, you thought maybe it could work. And But you made a couple of very interesting comments about total organic material testing and about sampling depth. And, and they're a little bit different from the way that I've been thinking about it. And so I thought, you know what, let me use my previous conversation with John to invite him on the show. 
and then let's mm -hmm. transition to talk about this because this to me is even more interesting than ph sure. it has more yeah. application to playing conditions and i thought it's wonderful to have a different perspective because sometimes due to scheduling difficulties i just do a monologue on this show and i don't get to talk to somebody else and i know people would rather hear me talk to somebody else instead of just me ranting about the topic of the day and secondly i thought it's wonderful to get a different perspective because i've had a few people comment that they they'd really like to hear me talk with people that that I can have a disagreement with or, or just a, 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 a broader perspective. So right. the first, the first thing you said was w with the total organic material testing, where we're just testing everything in the sample, you said yep. it's, it's, you've done some tests on this in Florida and you found that it can vary up to 1% over the course of a year simply sure. on differences in root mass and i thought that's that's i want you to elaborate on that if you will sure. and yep. and please clarify to everybody just to make sure we're talking about the same thing that we're we're talking yeah. about a total organic material test that's measuring both living and dead plant material right so right so the way i sampled in my research was i actually separated the thatch from the soil organic matter and I actually separated the dark soil organic material uh, from the light material that's underneath it. So I tested exclusively the dark soil organic matter, and I also tested the thatch layer. So when I hear total organic matter testing, I like the idea of it, and I think it's light years ahead of what we've been doing, especially if you're not testing the top inch or eight-tenths of an inch is light years ahead of that. But in my research, it was very clear where the thatch layer was, and it was very easy for me to separate it, test that sample, and I would usually get maybe 10 to 15% organic matter, which is thatch in this case. And then I would do my other sample, which would be just the soil organic matter, and that would typically be between three and maybe 6%, depending on um, the sample, obviously. So my contention, I guess, with the 246 method, although I, I like a lot about it, and to me, any data is good data. There's always ways to use it. This way, at least you have data from the top inch or top uh, 0.8 of an inch, uh, eight tenths of an inch. So at least you have something to go on. Um, I don't wholly agree with it because of a couple of different reasons, because I also I found distinct differences in root growth throughout the year, and it could be up to two to three times difference in weight of the roots, depending on the time of year. So and one sample could be Bermuda, Bermuda grass. This this is yeah. This was uh, I believe yeah. These were three ultra dwarf Bermuda grass cultivars. So I would get maybe as little as three grams of roots in one sample. Um, maybe an average of, uh, six grams or something like that for all the samples. And then in the different season, I would get in the teens, you know, so maybe it would be clearly two times more weight of roots in the samples. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that's a little bit of an issue, uh, not wholly. Uh, so the reason I think that's a little bit of an issue is because if you're taking samples, at a time where you're sort of in between that transition and you get a sample that's maybe a half a percent of organic material higher than the last test um, or maybe even a percent higher. So you, that may trigger something that may not totally be necessary. And I know testing it seasonally will take out most of the error in that, but I think there's so much difference in there. I, I would like to see something a little more specific particularly if you're taking the 246, at, like you said, you start taking ratings with your your samples. If you measured that top, that thatch layer in the top, you know, two centimeters or inch, whatever, whichever you're gonna use, um, I think that would give you a little more information versus just doing the 246, which I don't have a big problem with. I mean, at most you're probably gonna be 10%, 20% off, but I'm just a little bit concerned about that triggering an event 
that really isn't necessary um, just due to seasonal fluctuations. And the other reason why I think that rooting is important is because so say I, I have my rooting, I've done a lot of whatever to get my rooting better. So I've improved my rooting, right? It's great. I have three times as much roots as I had before I started whatever practices I was doing. But now I take my test and it shows the percent higher in total organic material. All right, well, now all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, a percent higher. I better go do something about that. Now, <laughs> if it's just the roots, then maybe that practice, you know, probably the core vacation may not necessarily be needed. That's sort of where I'm leaning towards. Wonderful. Thank you. So uh, that, that I think is, is something that I didn't fully realize at the start of doing this. And I soon realized that the best turf grass conditions tended to be in the soils that had the highest total organic material. Right. And if you look at a a particular golf course. So, so now we're on a, uh, whatever, 150, 200 acre property. And we've, we've got 18 greens there. And we, let's say we sample a third of them right? and we sample the best greens and the worst greens. What is it's common to find is that the, the green that one would consider the healthiest that's in the best growing environment has the highest total organic material. Be, which is measuring the living and dead plant material or the living and dead organic material in the soil and the worst grain or in the worst growing environment tends to be the lowest. And that that's something that has been surprising to a lot of my soil testing clients initially. And I have to talk them down from trying yeah. to do to from overreacting to that because I say, look, the the more organic matter you have, that's on your best green. So that, that yep. that's fine. And and the reason why, of course, is be is twofold. One is because you'll have a, a larger plant below ground. You'll have more rhizomes, more roots in a healthier growing environment or healthier grass. And secondly, over time, you would expect to accumulate more organic matter, more organic soil, organic matter, more humus in the soil that's growing under turf that's growing better. And so that that's, that is a complication of the OM246. Right. Yeah. But and I have one more issue. I mean, I hate to, to beat on it too much, but I have one more issue with the Com the combining of the top two layers sometimes not on purpose. So say you're taking that sample down to uh, uh, two centimeters, which is, you know, eight tenths of an inch. Say my thatch layer is only a half an inch or six tenths of an inch. Mm -hmm. So I've combined up to three tenths of an inch of the layer below it. Now, again, if you're taking notes on that and you know that, you can sort of do some simple math and figure out, okay, well, I added this much of this layer into this layer and, you know, maybe the number's a little bit higher. And again, does that really matter? I don't know. But, you know, as scientists, we like to be precise. And especially when I've done the research and I thought it was so easy as on these warm season turf grasses, I'm like, wow, you know, I don't know why, why aren't we just doing it that way? <laughs> but I understand the reason for 246 and I like the theory behind it for sure. So, and that was the second point that you mentioned in the, in the comment right, right. with Chris yeah. was rather than doing specific depths, you, uh, you thought it might be better to actually separate out where the soil, uh, the original root zone mix kind of has a break with the thatch yeah. or with the mat layer. And, uh, so both of the things that you've brought up make sense perhaps in a research environment for me, I'm going right. to say though, how let's go back to separating the living versus dead, the light versus dark organic matter. Is that something that right. a lab can reasonably do? Or is it something that a golf course superintendent can reasonably do when collecting samples? Yeah. The superintendent can do it very easily. Um, we did hundreds, thousands of samples. I don't know what the total number was, but 
it was so easy to do the thatch the difference the, you could find the edge of that thatch so easy you use some type of a probe a knife or a spatula or whatever you want to use and you just keep poking until from the, you start at the thatch and you go down and then next thing you know that spatula or knife just goes whoop, right through the soil and if you're using a big pelt like a cup cutter you use a bread knife and you can cut right along the edge of that thatch very easily so that's very easy to do and the second part, the dark organic matter, yeah, that's easy to do too because you can see it. If you're pulling out a profile, and I have pictures over here, but, you know, we're on the phone and my computer is broken, so uh, I don't know if I could really show them to you, but it's pretty clear where that ends. And there's a distinct difference in organic matter. Usually it's about a half a percent if the initial green was 90-10 or so um, uh, soil. You're going to have that at about a half a percent and the – part above it is probably is going to be anywhere from two to six percent or so so it's pretty clear to see to divide those up in my opinion but oh, okay so you're talking about separating the thatch layer but how do i separate the how do i separate the roots how do i separate live roots from dead roots and yeah. how do i separate humus from uh i i don't know humus from a rhizome so yeah, so that would just be dependent or that would depend upon a typical soil organic matter test, which they strain the roots out. And again, I, I've already um, this or I've already talked about, you know, the variation in root mass throughout the year. So they take those out of the equation. They go right to the soil organic matter, which is mostly humus, and they'll evaluate that. They'll burn that off at whatever. We burned it at 550 Celsius, and we thought that that was a good temperature we got what we thought were pretty good results and the and it's as simple as that in my opinion but 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 what we screen off that's not humus is going to be living plus dead uh well you sc you screen off any you, you use the number 10 sieve and you screen off anything that doesn't go through that so there may, there may be some living there may be you know some dead there and there it may be combined but I think the difference is negligible compared to the difference in root mass, it, in my opinion, again. Okay. Um, right. do, do you have an article? Is, is this in which, which article is this particular have, research in? Uh, I have it in agronomy journal and I have obviously my, my, uh, I forget if it was my thesis or my dissertation. I think this was my thesis. And what's the, so the, it's the in, what's the title of that one? Hang on a second, I actually have it here. So the title of that is Impact and Control of Organic Matter in USGA Ultra Dwarf Bermuda Grass Golf Greens. Impact and Control of or Organic, organic matter, matter in USGA Ultra Dwarf Bermuda Grass Golf Greens. Awesome. So I'm going to put a link to that article and I'm going to reread it and, and see... If, if uh, I want to uh, have another conversation with you after I've read it. Um, but right. I just, uh, so I'm going to make a case for OM246 the way okay. it is right now on the separation of, uh, of humus versus thatch. So, so I'm looking at like three things. Okay. Okay. The, I'm looking at three types of organic matter in the soil and we all lump them together into the OM246 method, the total organic material. Right. We've got we've got humus, which is is what is already uh, decomposed. Already decomposed. It's your more permanent type of organic matter in the soil. And then I'm looking at living, which is going to be yeah. a live rhizome, a live root, or um, you know, a live stem, something like that. And then right. there's another type of material, which is, I would call, uh, you know, it's the dead part of the thatch, uh, okay, which, yeah, which yeah. is for me, it's a, it's a, a rhizome. The mat. Well, yeah, so mat is, you know, mat and thatch, if you look at the exact definitions, uh, they're an intermingled layer of living and dead, uh, right. plant material. So, so, and, and if it's mat, it's mixed with soil. If it's thatch, then there's no soil mixed with it. That that's the definitions that I have in my head. So, okay. so the, 
so I think of warm season turf or cool any kind of turf, you're going to have some dead stems and some dead roots that have not fully decomposed yet that are not part of the living plant. And I, I don't really see how to separate those just on a, a number 10 sieve. And yeah. And so, so for OM246, I try to recommend uh, not sampling in the middle of the growing season. I, I think it makes sense to sample either at the start of the growing season or at the yeah. end of the growing, growing season. If it's maybe a, both, maybe both, although I would expect differences in root mass. So, yeah, so they're not really exactly comparable. So I'm generally the kind of person who recommends whether it's nutrients or organic material, I say just start by testing once a year because sure. you're in the United States, but I know there's a lot of people listening from around the world. And I know for the part of the world that I'm in, in Asia, there's a lot of places that don't test at all. If they yeah. do test, it's quite haphazard, like once every three and a half years of it's just like, <laughs> oh, I'm having some problems. Let me now let me do a test. And they're like, hey, do you yeah. have my last test? It's like, yeah, it was in 2018. And and that was in February. Now you're testing in August. And it's just yeah. sort of like, you can't really compare it. So um, I I think that the, the standard recommendation that I want to make to everybody is test once a year at the same time. And by the same time, I mean, plus or minus a couple weeks. So right. Um, and if it's in a tropical place where the grass grows year round, like in Bangkok, and I have a few clients in Bangkok, I, I generally am doing the testing at the end of the rainy season because I want to get the nutrients when they're at their lowest level possible. So we generally are testing in November, um, which in Bangkok is the end of the rainy season. So, um, it, but it's fine. If, if you already are testing and you want more information, then go ahead, do it twice a year. But I look at it as uh, that's costly. Are you getting, and I've had this discussion with Doug Soldat is, right. are we, you know, he's saying collect tissue testing, any kind of extra data is valuable. And I'm like, man, yeah. if, if we're not, if we're not taking action on the data that mm -hmm. we're collecting how 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 are we getting any value from that it's it's like as a researcher that's valuable because we want all the data we we uh we can get but as a as a turf grass manager as a golf course superintendent or as a sports field manager i think we can get over uh we, we can collect data that we don't take action on. And to me, that's, mm -hmm. that's not useful. Um, but I, I recognize there are differences of opinion about that, but I think with, with soil testing, uh, I'm, I'm of the same opinion of, uh, you know, if, if we're not going to take action on it and we're just collecting it to have for our records, then I'm not, not, uh, not so keen on it. Yeah. Now it depends on the type of test that you're doing. If it's a case that test, and again, I found major differences in case that, so I see a lot of district tests in my travels and there's a couple of knocks there. It could be a different you know, time of year when they do the test, like you're saying, or the other issue that I have is they, I think they separate the layers in inch layers or something like that. And I found if I'm assuming that they use a knife to separate these layers. And in my lab studies, when we separated the layers, we had a distinct reduction in KSAT. So, and it could be, I think it was 20% on average and it, could be even more of that sometimes. So that those are two sort of concerns I have about that. But um, yeah, so depend, and so again, I, I don't like to jump out the window when I see a, a bad number because I've seen KSAT and these district tests uh, an inch an hour. The greens are fantastic. You know, the organic matter could be four or 5%. The greens are fantastic. They're firm, they're playing fantastic. They're playing great. But I get that result back and, you know, you sort of feel obligated to do something with it, like you're sort of saying. But at what point do you jump? You know, that that's where the turf manager's expertise and knowledge comes in. He knows, or he or she knows, all right, well, I can see visually or by playing that there's a change in these greens. It's backed up by the data and the tests that I've taken. I better do something. 
uh, versus somebody that just sees a half a percent change in soil organic matter and and jumps out the window and says, I better airify. Now, he may have been right. He may have not been right. And in the end, what does it matter? You know, people airified since the, the beginning of the golf industry almost, or at least for the last 50 years. So one more airification isn't going to kill anybody. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, I, I don't like doing things that I don't need to do and don't benefit me. And I'm assuming most people are, in a, you know, similar to that. Yes. And I think Chris Tritabaugh's uh, approach that he's been describing about what he's been doing, which it, which is new for him. And I think the reason why he's been writing about it is because it's so different from the way he managed uh, 10, uh, 10 years ago. And, and he's been excited at how he gets more compliments from the members <laughs> and how, yeah. Yeah, you know, they have a very, you know, a lot of a lot of golf course superintendents manage properties where they have a a, a membership that is renowned for uh, you know, being good golfers, for being very mm. very um, you know, caring a lot about the playing conditions. And 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 Hazeltine National Golf Club is one of those clubs and for the membership at Hazeltine national to give the type of feedback that they've been giving to Chris mm -hmm. over the past couple of years is a, a nice indication that what he's doing is having a, an impact on the, on the thing that's, that's meaningful. And, and yeah, I, I feel like I understand a lot of this stuff intuitively about these tests and, and I'm definitely not making knee jerk reactions or, you know, taking a jump to do something based on a single test result. Um, right. And I suppose that, uh, the average person might be a little bit more inclined to take the advice of a professional like myself, or to take the advice of, of somebody else who's done their soil testing and is recommending this number is problematic. You should do something about this number. Yep. And, and I'm much, uh, much less likely to say that, but I don't think, uh, I don't think that everybody understands this intuitively the way that I do. But if, if, right. if you read every one of my blog posts, if you attend every one of my seminars, if you listen to every one of my podcasts, <laughs> what you would, what you would realize is I'm saying, let's use these numbers. Let's use these test results to make a site specific plan yeah. for managing the turf at your property, given your soils, given the way that you like to manage, given the type of grass that you have and, and given the, the recent weather conditions and the recent way that you've been managing and so on, let's use the test results, whether that's for nutrients, whether that's for organic material, whether that's for I mean, those are the main things that I'm measuring in the soil. Let's relate those to playability, which, yep. which is kind of a new thing for me to be so keen on measuring. And I know the USGA has the Deacon platform that, uh, is, is a excellent way for people to record some of that play playability data, which is so important to track how the conditions are over time. And then to be able to, to analyze that and, and, and see how the maintenance practices, whether it's top dressing or whether it's fertilizer or growth regulator or whatever, how that has an effect on, on the playability. And I suppose Greenkeeper app does, does, has some of that functionality, but, but the main thing is the organic, what, what I'm trying to say, what I, I try to explain again and again, and, and I don't think everybody completely, maybe some people don't agree with me, but some people just don't quite understand where I'm coming from with the data is that I want people to know what the playability is and make decisions about how they're going to change their fertilizer or how they're going to change their organic material management based on the trend in playability and the conditions in playability. And the whole idea is to do the work, to adjust the work at your site to maximize the number of days in the year at which you achieve your desired playing surface. And that, of course, translates to lawns. And it I always talk about this 
because I have examples that are, are specific to golf. But of course that translates to lawns, it translates to sports fields, and it translates to any type of turf grass surface. And that's where I'm wanting to use the data for. Um, so yeah, definitely don't just, whether it's a pH number, an infiltration rate number, uh, a KSAT number, uh, a total organic material number, don't, don't make rash decisions. Use the data to, to optimize site specific management. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, I, I listened to, I may not have listened to all, to all of your podcasts and maybe haven't read all of your blogs, but I've read a, enough to know that, you know, you're very into what you do and you're very good at what you do. And usually what you say is right on the money. So I, I usually listen to you and do what you say. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, well, thank you. Um, I, I've got, I've got a couple minutes left, uh, if, okay. if you do, and I want to explore in a little bit more detail, the topic I, I talked about separating the organic material and I'm trying to make okay. a case for OM246 where if we yeah. could separate the living from the dead, if we could separate yeah. those components, uh, maybe that's, you some... think that's significant? I mean, what, what percentage well, it's, of each it's, do you think is in there? Uh, I, I'd have to do a little bit more math, but off the top of my head, I'd say for any, and it's going to vary by depth because you're going to have a lot more right. humus. Uh, well, let's just say that on, in general, you might of the total organic material number. So we're talking about an yep. OM246 test result number. Um, I'm going to say that we might be. 10% of that number would be humus. And so we're talking second and third levels or what are we talking here? Two to four, four to six. I, I'm, I'm just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to okay. assume it's the same by depth. I, I'm, yep. I'm not, I'm not going to, but, but clearly it's going to depend on grass type site condition and depth. But, but I, I don't know. Uh, so I'm just going to say in general, if, how yep. about we just combine all the, the OM2, the OM4 and the OM6 and just say okay. that entire yep. number, which for me on the test results, I combine those adjust for bulk density and, and give a zero to six centimeter depth number. So right. for that, I'm going to guess that we're of that number. Let's say, let's say the number is 5% yep. total organic material. I'm going to mm -hmm. say half a percent of that is humus and okay. I'm going to say maybe, I mean, it, it depends on how thatchy it is because thatch to me is, is mostly dead. So I'm, I'm going to say it's going to tend to be like then, uh, let's say 50% dead, but not humus and 40% living. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So, but that's, I've never tried to separate it. So yeah, you, I don't you know did, if anyone I, has, I, well, you I haven't, <laughs> but, but you say you sort of did in the, in the article, sort of, that, yeah. right? Yeah. So I'm going to read that and, 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 uh, and see, um, yeah. But so I, yeah, we just used, I, I would, I would characterize it more along the lines of, I took the living organic matter, which in this case is thatch. I, I, I would call it thatch. And I tried to separate that from whatever else is in that sample. And mm. That was the only distinction I think I was trying to make. Okay. Because okay. it was a very clear line where I could, I could separate those out. But that was a, when you're saying how shallow that layer was of thatch. Right. Yeah. That, that tells that, that makes me think that the green was about 18 months old or something. No, the green I, the, I did the study on was seven years old, eight years old by the time I was done. It was, I believe, I think it was a two-year study. It was a two-season study over two years. So you go... Um, you but go, it was seven years old at the start. And you go down to original root zone mix at, at less than an inch? No, no, no. The original root zone mix was down around three or four inches, maybe a little deeper than that. Okay, so you're, you're, you're separating thatch from mat. Is that, is that what, you... uh, well, I, I was trying to separate thatch from what would be considered soil organic matter. So in this case, they probably did include a little bit of living material in there, mm -hmm. but I would, I would, I, I look at Matt 
a little more like dead material. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, and again, I haven't separated that out. I don't know if anyone has, um, mm-hmm. you know, because the distinction is a little bit hazy between the two, or be, at least between, yeah, between uh, soil organic matter and the mat layer. Mm-hmm. So um, how much, you know, does that matter? And what difference is there? I don't know. Well, you, but, um, you know, you, you bring up some very good points and, and it's sort of, to me, it sounds like that would be the ideal way to do it. But at the same time, as we talk about it, it reminds me that it's complicated to do it consistently. And that's why yeah, I kind be. of, I kind of like the OM246 method because, sure. okay, it's crude to just do those specific depths, but by doing those specific depths, we take all of the question marks out of it. It's consistent to a point, you know, and then as the green ages, you know, how young is the green when you're starting? How much are those layers moving down? How much is one layer going into the other? But again, what you need to do is take simple measurements as you're doing these tests or back it up. Like I think I've heard you say with the soil organic matter test. And in this case, just send off a thatch belt as well. This way you'll have a little more data. If you're only doing it once a year, what's the big deal? But uh, I would take measurements of the 246 samples that I took and measure how deep that thatch went. And if there was distinct differences between the layers, I would just make note of it. You can easily figure out the difference by, so say my top, my thatch is 10%. And say that went all the way to the bottom of that point, you know, that one inch sample or two centimeter sample. So, okay, that's 10%. The layer below it, maybe 2%. If I'm mixing 2% in with 10%, even if it's just two tenths of an inch, you know, it's significant, but you can just figure that out real easy by measuring it and say, you know, and this way over time, regardless of where the layers move, if they do move, you'll know and you'll be able to figure out, okay, well, it's a little more precise, you know, doing it that way, I think. And it doesn't take that much more effort. Yeah, if you want to go to that much complication of it, I just say, yeah, look, it's only ten percent or fifteen percent. But if if I've got a if I've got a a brand new green, and it, it might have a little bit of uh, rhizomes and organic, let's say living organic material, a lot of it, like in the top uh, one centimeter. Okay, so basically we're yeah, in the top half of it. Half of it. The bottom right. half of it is original root zone mix, which is almost all sand and a negligible amount of organic matter. For me, when I take that sample, I know what I'm dealing with. And so that's going to, let's say that that comes back and the total organic material is like 3.5%, which would be typical for that type of sample. Okay. Um, So, you know, or, or, yeah, I mean, that's about as low as, as I've measured on total organic material. So from a new green, you're going to be something like 3% in, in the top two centimeters. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. But all that, like, that's, that's fine for me. I, I don't really care that the thatch, if we call it the thatch layer, the layer that there's mostly organic material, but there's going to be some sand mixed in there. Uh, of I, course. I, I expect it doesn't really matter to me whether that's 8% or 9% or 10% that I, right. and, and I haven't measured it because I'm just trying to track over time, the top two centimeters. Now, sure. um, although I, I will say, you know, the OM246 is, is nothing new. It's, uh, it, it's something that's been done in New Zealand and in the UK for quite a long time. So we're going back 20 plus years and people in those countries have told me, that it is, they like to split now and it kind of becomes standard to split the, the, they still do two, four, six. Sometimes they do two, four, six, eight, but in the top two centimeters, they cut it at, at one centimeter. So they're looking uh, at the, and, and so you might, you might be, uh, the type of, of turf grass manager or the type of scientist who wants that extra data. And, <laughs> right. and you might say, yeah, let's do it this way. And yep. that's something I always want it to be as simple as possible. So yeah. I've always been resistant to that. And I'm like, you know what? I find the two, four, six so useful. And I'm like, why do, 
what what extra information am I going to get from only the the top one centimeter? But of course, uh, I I tend to be resistant to this type of stuff, and then once I realize it's useful, I then become a proponent of it. So uh, check back with me five years from now, and I may be saying, <laughs> "All you guys doing two centimeters? It's not good enough." <laughs> <laughs> yep. All righty, John. No, well, it's a great yeah. tool, and like I said, it's light years above what we've been doing. So, you know. well, good. I I really appreciate your feedback on this and your insight, and hopefully, the people who listen to this or watch it will uh, will get some more insight about the intricacies of this and things to think about. Um, and and I guess my take home message would be: if you're doing the total organic material testing or testing for pH or doing nutrients. Test at the same time every year. I don't really like mid-season uh, because you do have a lot of changes in growth and you might have just made a fertilizer application or something. So um, I, I do recommend test start of season or end of season. If it's a more tropical place, test uh, at the end of the rainy season. And if you're in a Mediterranean type climate, don't test when all the salt is accumulated after irrigation water. Test after it's it's uh there's been some rainfall and it's leached out a little bit so that i mean that and and that also by testing consistently we minimize that variation that you've identified by changes in plant biomass living plant biomass in the roots and and that is an issue um and i may i have some data on uh august no july samples which is mid-season at hazeltine versus end of season and it's a bit different okay. and oh, okay. um and I may, with Chris Tritabal's permission, uh, I'll talk with him about that, see if I can share some of that, and we get a different line on OM2. So the, the okay. samples in the, in the summer are a little bit lower than they are in the autumn, and I suppose that if you, if you look at the, the weather from August and September into mid-October, in Minneapolis, that's good root growing weather for creeping bent grass. So I suppose that you tend to accumulate more living organic material underground that's captured in the OM2 test and the OM2 component of the OM246. That's why in July, they're a little bit lower than they are in October generally. And, and essentially we're not looking at real differences in, in problematic organic material. I think we're just looking at differences in that case, in in uh, seasonal seasonal root growth, seasonal underground biomass, and and that's the kind of thing that one needs to not overreact by looking at tests at at, right. at numbers and and know a little bit about what one is looking at. Yeah, use use your data and your test results in combination with what you're seeing in the field or on the golf course. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to use it. All righty. Okay. Well, uh, it looks like there's some people wandering around the house and I need to get going to the airport and it's getting late where you are. So thanks a lot, John. I, I appreciate sure, my it. My pleasure. Yep. yep. All right. My pleasure. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening and uh, thanks for watching. And I will sign off now for ATC from Ishigaki. I am Michael Woods. Bye-bye. <laughs>